<laughs> so what I want to talk about today is, is uh, I'll, I'll break this into three phases. First, I want to talk about muscle physiology and how muscle physiology determines the power you can produce while cycling. There, it is not a black box. Muscle properties are well understood, uh, and those muscle properties give rise to the power you produce when you sprint. So what's true of, uh, in, our, in our lab, a hamster on a muscle uh, lever system is also true of you if you're pedaling your bike or if you're pedaling one of my cycle drivers. We'll then say, all right, that muscle physiology also leads to how you train to improve your power. Because we know the physiological basis, we know what, uh, how these physiological systems respond to training, and what we'll find is that there are some unintended consequences to training. And, and those often uh, actually prevent you from getting faster. And I'll show you how that works out. And then the last bit is I want to link, I want to talk about aerodynamics and, and really more globally uh, modeling, uh, which links power and speed. Because you can have all the power you want, but if you're pushing a gigantic hole through the air, uh, you're, you're not going to go very fast. So, so let's start with uh, the maximal cycling torque and power cadence relationship. And here's what it is. Uh, and I've just normalized this. I didn't want to put any numbers up. So 100% of your maximum power, your max power will occur somewhere around, uh, it depends on your muscle fiber type, but generally it'll be around 120 to 125 in a really fast twitch fiber person. Uh, you might see 130, right? but but this uh, this is a typical relationship. Uh, torque decreases linearly with cadence. Power exhibits this shape with a local maximum again somewhere around 125 rpm. So 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 here's the roll up, and then you see an open circle here that's really close to these filled circles. So that's that's their they're just starting to hit it. Now you see open circles that are right on the line. That's, they're, they're uh, maximally sprinting and they haven't started the fatigue yet. But then fatigue sets in and you start to see these points diverge from the line. But uh, all of these, the, the, this rider, this is this rider's maximum curve in the rested condition. And then these are the points that you actually see during the competition. So yes, you don't see that on the power meter. And that's because it represents a very carefully controlled and rested state that you almost ne ne never get to see. That doesn't mean it's not important. It actually is really important because it tells you the maximum potential of the rider or, or of the muscle. Now, those of you, oh, and, I, and somebody mentioned something about gear choice and bigger gears, and, and I think within cycling culture these days, certainly there's a move to bigger gears, and, and I can tell you a story about that, but we'll, we'll, we'll save that for later. Um, so, if you think about athletes that are producing between 1,000 and 2,000 watts, this would be their torque cadence relationship, but I've, I've changed it here on this axis to be pedal force, average pedal force. And if you look at a, even a person who's doing 2,000 watts, and you look out here in the range of pedaling rates that you're likely to see, so again, 120-ish, then if you're over here at about 200 and something pounds, which is probably less than one and a half times body weight. And so one of the one of the things I want to point out to you here is even with big gears that would keep your pedaling rate down around 120-ish, forces aren't that high. You don't have to be that strong to pedal at a reasonable cadence. And, and I think the important thing there as well is it's not just that, it's the difference. You know, if you go from a hundred inch gear to a hundred and ten inch gear. The force per pedal stroke is 10% more. If you're going the same speed, you're doing 10% less pedal pedal strokes. So the force is you don't have to be twice as strong to go up 10 inches in gear. And I think there's a, a, a you know I, I often get told by coaches my rider isn't strong enough for that gear, and that's just not true. Because if you look at this end of the of the graph, you know when you're doing a standing start, your force is much much bigger than when you're doing a flying 200. So they can handle the gear. Okay. So, so again, just coming back to these shapes, so this for force or torque and this for power, 
Some of you have no doubt seen some physiology in your background. I know there's one master's trained physiologist in here somewhere. So, um, so what you'll what you'll say, and you'd be right, is, oh, I know why that is. That's because this is what the uh, force velocity and power velocity curve looks like for uh, muscle. If you, if you take and dissect out a rat gastroc and you put it on a muscle lever and you stimulate it uh, at different speeds, you'll get this. And that's exactly right. And that's a big factor. But there's more to it than that when you do cycling. When you do cycling, your muscle cycles on and off. And that turns out to be really important and so, so if you, and this is some uh, mathematical modeling, we just had this paper accepted in Journal of Experimental Biology. Um, if you look at the, at the power that a muscle can produce, even when it's cycling, if, if you can turn it on infinitely fast and, and have it relax infinitely fast, then it would look like this. And this, this happens to be vastus lateralis going through a cycling motion. Uh, so it would produce a lot of power, and it would reach a peak way out here at over 200 RPM. But when you model that same muscle with um, reasonable and, and accurate uh, activation and relaxation dynamics, then two things happen. Power comes way down and the optimal pedaling rate comes back to about 120, 125. And that's because muscles don't become activated immediately. When you turn a muscle on, it takes a while before it generates force, right? So in this case, about five one hundredths of a second before it can generate maximum force. That's not so bad. What is bad is when you turn the muscle off, it takes about two tenths of a second to fully relax. And that's a long time. It doesn't sound long, two tenths. Ah, who cares? Well, you care because when you pedal at 120 RPM, that means one half a second for a revolution. That means one quarter of a second for one leg extension action, right? Cycling is leg extension action followed by leg flexion action. There's no circles. There are limbs extending and flexing. And this starts to occupy a really large portion of that. And so relaxation, uh, dynamics become really important. Can I just further expand on that? This, for me, is going to be one of the most important things, if not the most important thing you take away from this. <clears throat> so what's happening? You start at the top of the pedal stroke, you can't put full power in because the lever isn't right. You get down to here, you're now at maximum power. You get down to here, you're losing power because, again, the lever isn't right. When you get to here, you're pushing against yourself. So you turn the muscle fibers on at the top, you start pushing hard. By here, you're pushing really hard. Here, you've actually got to start turning the muscle fibers off, or what's going to happen when you get to the bottom of the stroke? Anyone? Shout out loud. You're pushing, you're pushing against yourself. And as the pedal comes back up, you're still firing down and you're pushing against yourself. You're creating negative power. So when people talk about, oh, I'm pedaling in a circle and I'm pulling up hard, that's just not happening. Most people are creating negative power as they're coming back up, not positive power by pulling the pedals up. So how fast you can turn this process off is vital for how much of this part of the pedal stroke that you can use. Because the earlier you have to turn the firing pattern off, the less of this you've got to use to create force. And as we're talking about, you've got 0.25 of a second to create force at 120 RPMs. That really is not very long. So this, what we're gonna do with this, and when we come to talking about training and how it affects it, this is absolutely vital. Fight. <clears throat> Thanks, Lee. So um, here's and here's a model. Uh, this is some work done by Ben Soust and, and Cassius, and this is old now. But what they they did essentially what I showed you a minute ago. They modeled the whole cycling action, all the muscles in the leg, essentially what we did too. But um, they did um, infinitely fast or instantaneous activation and relaxation. And they did, and then in the open circles here are realistic activation and, and relaxation. And what you see is the <coughs> realistic model goes right where the, the actual humans did, right? This looks just like their, their subjects. But the infinitely fast 
Uh, again, max power is occurring out around 200 RPM, and it's uh, over double the, uh, the actual power. So it, it turns out that these activation and relaxation dynamics are, are really quite important. And wh why, how are they important? They're important in two ways. First of all, so, so the black represents uh, a muscle that becomes activated and relaxed uh, instantaneously. The red is realistic. And what you see is uh, when the, the optimal pattern for turning on the muscle is you turn it on a little bit before it starts to shorten, right? So you turn on your leg extensors a little before you get to top dead center. And then activation is pretty fast. So boom, right away, you're right in line with what the muscle can do. But relaxation is much slower. And so you do two things. First of all, you have to turn the muscle off well in advance of when it finishes shortening. You have to turn the muscle off well in advance of when you reach the bottom of the pedal stroke. And even when you do that, so, so by doing that, you lose all this power that you could have produced if you had really fast kinetics. But even here, even when you turn it off here, you're still waiting for the muscle to relax when it starts lengthening again. In other words, when your leg extensors are starting to flex. And this is not poor coordination. This is the optimal solution. This is the most power this muscle can produce. By turning it off here, losing this, and then dealing with this negative power. If I turned it off sooner to get rid of this, I'd lose more of this. If I left it on longer to reduce this, I'd get more negative. So this is an unavoidable consequence of realistic relaxation dynamics. And the point is, what we, one, of the, one of the things we're going to want to train is to make those dynamics faster. Uh, this is the, the paper we just published. One of the things that Lee wanted me to cover was, was this notion that uh, there are some magical techniques that will make you more powerful. Right, that, that, well, if you pedal a circle or if you pull up or you scrape the mud or whatever the, the current fad is, you'll be more powerful. And, and you won't. You can't. And what we, so what we did in this study uh, was we took all 38 muscles in the leg that can extend and flex the leg, and we optimized the power that each muscle produced. And then we stacked them back together. We went through the muscle tendon moment arms. We created joint powers. And in each case, what you see is incredible agreement for the overall, for the knee, for the hip, and for the ankle. You see really, really good agreement between what people do and what their muscles are capable of doing. In fact, the biggest difference that you see is, uh, is in this area for the ankle. And the only the, the problem with the model is that it was the motion was constrained. If you actually produced this, you'd be pushing backwards on the pedal. So, so the muscle could produce some the ankle muscles could produce some more power here, but it'd be bad. So so the knee is almost identical. Our cyclists were actually more powerful than the model, so they they probably had bigger glutes in this case. Uh, there, there's uh, in other words, don't spend a lot of time telling your, your athlete how to pedal. Your pedaling is using spinal cord level motor control programs uh, and they'll take care of themselves. So what you do do to improve efficiency is what we're going to come to in a moment is how you set the training is what's going to affect their efficiency, not telling them think about pulling up or think about pulling down. You can't do that. It's all happening too fast. The body's taking care of that. It's the training you as coaches, you as riders select. That's what makes a difference in how efficient you are making use of that pedal strike. So take home message number one, right? You said there was going to be a pop quiz. <laughs> Muscle relaxation is vital for maximal power. Boom. Uh, I guess sub, sub message or message 1A would be that, that power is dependent on cadence as well. Um, Okay, now max power, as you, as you saw earlier, max power is important, right? This curve is important, but also dealing with fatigue is, is important as well. And so the next section, I want to talk about what's the physiology behind 
fatigue or fatigue resistance. And uh, so these are... Sorry, Jim, can't you? Sorry, I forgot to say this just at the end of that last slide. <clears throat> Don't think doing lots of cycling is going to make you more efficient at pedaling either. In fact, you learn to pedal like very quickly. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. So doing more of it doesn't make you more efficient. And we're going to come to that in a little point. But I just want to kind of add that to it. That oh. You think if you do lots of cycling that you're going to get more efficient. And that's what we've been told for years. You know, it's what I grew up with. That the more cycling you do, the more efficient your pedal stroke gets. That's just not true. That's not what happens. Yeah. yeah. And, and I would say that a little bit differently. The, the stroke itself won't get more efficient. What will happen, and, and this will turn out to be disastrous, is if you do, in fact, go out and do a lot of cycling, 25,000 K a year, something like that, your muscles will become more metabolically efficient. That's because they'll become slow twitch and they'll become less powerful. So metabolic efficiency, so how, how much oxygen cost is associated with however much power, that's, that's efficiency. And that will get better if you do a lot of mileage, but you'll also get horribly slow as a sprinter. So, so Chuck, better is an endurance session. Huh? But better is an endurance session. That's right. That's right. And so if you want to hit the road, then hit the road. Uh, anyway, so, so let's talk about fatigue resistance. So, so this, is a, this is an older study, but we've, we've recently replicated it ourselves. When you, when you hold cadence constant, and you can really only do this in the lab, I, mean, I guess you could do it with a lot of careful shifting on the road. Uh, but if you, if you pedal at a higher pedaling rate, so in this case 140 RPM, what you'll find is that you fatigue more quickly. And if you pedal at a slower pedaling rate, in this case 60 RPM, you fatigue much more slowly. And this, we, we talked about this very briefly earlier. Um, and we've, as I said, we've recently replicated that. Uh, so so this, is, this is a really interesting data set to me as my lab geek self, but also as a cyclist. So this is, uh, represents 30 cyclists, 20 of whom were uh, velodrome cyclists at, um, down in Adelaide. Actually, six or seven of those were Chinese guys who were down there for a camp. Uh, and then 10 of them are Utah road cyclists. And this was Jen Hillam, who was uh, doing some undergraduate work in my lab again. Nick Fleiger, who's the uh, head sprint coach at, at uh, Cycling Australia now. And what, what we saw is exactly uh, uh, what you saw earlier. When you pedal faster, uh, you fatigue. Well, here, here's, 100, uh, here's 160 RPM. You fatigue much more rapidly than if you pedal at. Uh, 90 RPM, 89 RPM. And uh, one of the things, that, this is what I think what Lee was getting at earlier was uh, uh, there, there, there's, even in sprint culture, sprint cycling culture, there's a big move for a lot of pressure, I think, to have road fitness, right? A, a sprint tournament can be eight or more rounds, each one with a warm up and a warm down. And by the time you're done with the sprint tournament, you've done a lot of work. And so you have to be fit to, to survive that. Right? And it's true. You do have to be fit to survive it. Uh, but the question then is, how do you get fit and stay powerful? And uh, one, one thought is, well, the more road fitness you have, the, the more fatigue resistant you'll be and the better you'll be able to recover between sprints. And I see somebody shaking his head. Well, there, there, there's two, isn't there, actually? So there's, there's the thought that the more aerobic fitness you have, the quicker you recover. That's one. And the second, which we're going to look at now as well, is that the more aerobic fitness you have, the better speed endurance you have. So they're the two common thoughts on why you might want to do aerobic training as a sprinter. That's right. That's right. So you'll be more fatigue resistant if you're fit. And so, so interestingly, uh, the, the white squares here are all of the track cyclists from Adelaide, and the black uh, squares are the road cyclists from Utah. Uh, these are the different pedaling rates, and they're all normalized, and, and never mind the nuance here. The, the big picture here is look at the black and white squares. Mm -hmm. they're, they're all together. So these skinny, right, in order to be a Cat 1 roadie in Utah, you, you have to be skinny, right? Skinny and slow twitch. Uh, in order to be a good track cyclist, you have to be stocky and fast twitch. Uh, no difference in their rates of fatigue. None. Zero. 
They are not more fatigue resistant. So I just want to reiterate that. These aerobic guys do not have better speed resistance and speed endurance than the track sprinters do. Yeah. We should just let that sit. For a yeah, I mean, that time. is, that's a big takeaway. So what, that aerobic what time work. time frame period you're putting on those uh, graphs? Uh, 20 seconds. Okay. Okay, so we're in a very short time window. Yeah, yeah. The okay. time we care about for sprinting. Okay. Yes, sir. But you are also talking about highly trained sprint cyclists that are at least in, in moderately good shape. Like we're not talking about completely. Awesome. I've never, you know, I'm fresh off the couch. Type of, like, yeah, so that's like, true. That, that's right. Lap, that's that's right. Some, well, it might not be road fitness. They do have fitness. Perfect. Perfect. That's going to lead into the next bit. Nice. Good point. So, um, uh, let's see, another, oh, that actually, that'll be in the training part. Uh, so, so one of the things that I want you to notice again is that pedaling at 89 RPM, we saw 31% fatigue. At 125 RPM, we saw 48. And then at 160, we saw 56% fatigue. Now, that does that mean that pedaling at a higher pedaling rate is more fatiguing or does it just mean that power changes more? And it turns out that this is a study for, by Brian McIntosh at uh, Calgary. He showed that, so, so this is, this is a, another power pedaling rate curve, just like you saw. This is a rested state, and this is a fatigue state. This is one fatigue state. So they, they got tired, and then they, they, they were rested, they got their power pedaling rate, they got tired, and then they got another one. And what you see is that the, the, the maximum value obviously comes down, right? You're fatigued. You're producing less power. But importantly, the shape of this curve changes such that whereas you did probably have a maximum out here around 240 or 250 like I showed earlier, now you've got a maximum here around 150. So what happens then is if you were pedaling out here, I've got this maybe at 140, which would have been fairly typical of sprinters, um, you're going to see a gigantic reduction in power. If instead you were pedaling over here at, whatever, I think this is 89-ish, then you see a much smaller uh, reduction in power. So this is a fatigue state. I am tired. You are tired when you get to this point in the track, but it manifests differently depending and that'll come in. We well, one thing we won't talk about today, but I can, uh, is is using mathematical modeling. I'll, I'll just skim it very lightly. The only way to get at how to optimize, because I think somebody mentioned your choice, the way to optimize that is with mathematical modeling. I'll show you that we can do that. Uh, okay. And and then what goes on there? Why why do your why does this whole shape change? Well, let's go back to our model again of just the muscle. So again, infinitely fast kinetics, realistic rested kinetics. And then here, this is uh, some data from Peter Hespel, who, who is actually uh, Tom Boonin's physiologist, or was. And what you see is a reduction in the, the force, which brings down the, the maximum power. But you also see dramatic slowing in the relaxation. So... Not only do you come down in power, but you go up in negative power. Right? So as you, you, you uh, when you turn the muscle off, it takes longer to relax, and you get much more negative power. And this is why I, I think you've all experienced this. You go to a sprint tournament. So, so let's say you stop tr doing strength training at, at, at the end of the winter season, and you, and you go simply to track. You go to a sprint tournament or you ride a kilo. Anybody been sore? Had delayed onset muscle soreness the next day? Weak? It's because of this. It's because this becomes an eccentric activity because your muscle doesn't turn off. Uh, when you're pedaling squares, that muscle is still on while it's being stretched, and that's why you get DOMS. Uh, following a hard sprint tournament or, or a kilo. And, and this is when you're on the bike and you're doing a sprint effort 
you know when you're starting to fatigue and you feel like you just can't pedal anymore you know that feeling of like you're just losing coordination this is exactly what's happening you're still firing one leg as the other leg is pushing down you're now actually firing against yourself and the more fatigued you are the more even that is and that's why we slow down so quickly at the end of an effort because you're firing against yourself pretty hard now and that's why it's hard to maintain going quickly and you see it with riders you know when you see somebody bouncing up and down in the saddle that's exactly what's happening they're pushing down with one leg as the other leg's pushing down and they're pushing themselves up out of the saddle and you might expect, well, okay, so, so now relaxation is slower. Well, that means the optimal solution is to turn it off a little earlier. But people don't do that. They do not adjust with fatigue. When you look at EMG studies during uh, a, a fatiguing trial, they turn it on and turn it off at exactly the same time, even when they're fatigued, which is why I've grabbed it this way. So you get really uh, horrendous negative power. Can you control that? Can you fire and train yourself to fire earlier? Not that I know of. Okay, uh, I, think, I think you've, you've got one spinal cord level program that you're using, and it doesn't tune itself well, at least in the studies I've seen, it doesn't tune itself well to the fatigue state. So take home message number two. Uh, more power loss at high cadence. And again, relaxation is, is uh, an important factor here. So, so now let's talk about how you let that physiology drive proper training. So I'll talk about how you increase muscle power by increasing muscular force and by improving activation and relaxation, uh, and how you might improve. It's really weird to talk. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I am a native Texan, right? so I'm used to <laughs> grew up with guns. Um, anyway, uh, and how you might train to improve uh, fatigue resistance and what some of the unintended consequences might be of training. So um, I want to talk, This we'll spend some time on this slide. So uh, hack it, there are lots of strength training studies. There is a journal called the Journal of Strength and Conditioning. There's another one called the Journal of Strength and Conditioning Research. There are hundreds of strength training studies published every year. You know how many of them report? Relaxation? <laughs> Two studies have reported relaxation, and they're both from Hakkinen when he was doing his PhD with Comey in 1985. He's now like head of school at some university in, in Finland. But uh, so in one group, he had them do heavy resistance training, like you might do in the gym if you wanted to train to be a power lifter. And by the way, power lifting is the most misnamed sport on the face of the earth. Or, or maybe it's second behind figure skating where they no longer skate figures. <laughs> no. <laughs> anyway, um, so, so uh, you might, if you were a power lifter, uh, you might do really, really heavy training. And you might get tremendous increases in your squat, in your uh, isometric strength, right? In this case, their subjects gain 27%. It's nothing to sneeze at, right? That's a lot of strength improvement. But, Interestingly, their, the time that required to activate their muscle actually got increased. They got slower <coughs> activation a little bit, and they got much slower relaxation. Now, so to bring that back to your pedaling dynamics, that means you're shortening the time that you can put power through the pedal stroke. So you have more of it because you're stronger, but you have less time to put it through the pedal stroke. And so we've, uh, again, this is vastus lateralis, you know, we're just using it as our, as our model. The black is the baseline condition. Uh, in this case, the red is the heavy strength training program. And what you see here is, yeah, 8% improvement in power. Well done. Not 27%. Uh, and not only is it not 27%, but look, that power is now occurring over here about 90 RPM or less. And the reason is that's because how quickly it fatigues as well. That's right. And once you get up to some high pedaling rate, you're actually less powerful than you were untrained. Now, in one of his other studies, he did an explosive training program with plyometric type stuff. Now, these guys only increase strength by 10%. Yeah, modest, huh? But they improved 
their activation time, they got faster, less time, faster, and they improved relaxation time. So when you model those, you get this blue curve where you've got a 14% increase in power. So you're increasing power more than strength, and uh, it's shifted out here to occurring at higher pedaling rates. Now, you guys all go through some sort of periodization where you're going to be in a heavy strength train phase and then a power phase. Now, he didn't do that. You, you typically don't see that in training studies because they take too long. You simply can't afford the time. So what I did was I said, well, what if, what if you had some sort of periodization program, a periodized program, that gives you the strength of the heavy program, but the activation and relaxation kinetics of the explosive program, then I've got that shown here in gold for gold metal, because now you've improved power by 31%, uh, and you've got a really broad range of pedaling rates to take advantage of. And just to kind of how that plays out in the training that I set with my athletes, when we're in a heavy strength phase, we find we go slower on the track. When we go into the explosive stage, we're much more interested in the speed that we're doing on the track. The gym volume is much less, the sessions take less time, and they're much less fatiguing, and you notice an immediate improvement on their times on the track. And you know, the question we're still trying to figure out is, as Jim said, is how much of the strength do you need to do to get the benefit of it to be able to then do the explosive stuff? Interestingly, we've been trying some different stuff this year. When we're going back to the gym and doing the heavy stuff after a period of doing the explosive stuff and then a period of rest at the end of it, we're not losing hardly any strength at all. And what's happened in the three phases we've done with it so far this year is the athletes in each strength phase have got a little bit stronger, but after eight weeks of doing explosive stuff and a couple of weeks of rest, they're starting back the strength phase almost at the point they finished the last block. And by the end of that block, they're going slightly above where they started the block or slightly above where they finished the previous block. So don't be afraid to do this activation stuff because you think you're going to use a lot of strength. You don't lose a lot of strength by doing it. Okay. Good practical example. So you're, you're doing way more power work in the gym than Yeah, strength. lighter, faster movements. But you're doing more weeks of power than strength. It's about the same. So what combination are you using to get the goal? Actually, over the entire year, there's more power than there is strength. But during the cycle, kind of the strength block is a similar length to the power block, and then you have the speed block on the end of it. So add the speed block and the power block together. For the year, we're doing less strength, yeah. Um, that, can I comment on yeah. that? Yeah. I think that depends a lot on the level of the athlete. Of course. An athlete who's had many years of training condition and, and, and strength training needs lesser and lesser of yeah. lesser time in the strength bases. Yeah. You hang on to strength pretty well. Yeah, that's true. Um, is, your goal, sorry, is your goal curve based on testing or is that theoretical? It's theoretical, and that, that was your question. So what I did here was I said, okay, what if what if you got 27% stronger, but with faster activation and faster deactivation compared to the baseline? That's the goal curve. Okay, so take home message three, training, explosive training is essential for improving maximum power, which you probably knew intuitively, but you get <coughs> so hung up in the gym on one RM squat, right? If, it, if you're not doing two times body weight, then what good are you? Well, what good are you if you do? It doesn't matter <laughs> unless you've got uh, explosive How quickly you can lift it is more important. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, now, uh, can, I, can I just do one thing to add to that as well? And the example of that is, I bet all of us here have seen people in the gym that were very, very strong but couldn't go fast on a bike. You know, I used to train with a, a bodybuilder. He could squat 200 pounds more than me, and he was lighter than me. In a 100-meter standing start, I'd put 25 meters into him. So, you know, there's a difference between low speed strength and high speed strength, and track sprinters are mainly high speed strength athletes. What we're doing is happening very, very quickly, relatively speaking. You haven't got long to put the power through the bike, so it's vital that you maximize that. 
it's only in a standing start that we're pedaling slow enough to get kind of near those big forces that you're hitting in the gym. So yeah. you basically saying all lifting should be fast? You need some time under the load. So the longer you've got under the load, the more it stimulates the muscles. So if you want to get some hypertrophy, you've got to have some time under load. It's, what would you call it? The muscle tension under load. You need some of that to stimulate the muscle, but don't be so focused on that's the only thing you do. You've got to be doing fast stuff. Um, so, and and uh, I think the answer to your question is it doesn't actually have to move fast as much as it has to. You have to intend to move it fast. Not quite, Joe. And uh, <coughs> talking about uh, training for fatigue resistance. And here I'm going to again take off my cycling hat and put on my my uh, muscle physiologist hat. So there's a there's an experimental paradigm used in muscle physiology called chronic motor stimulation, or chronic motor nerve, or chronic muscle stimulation. And in this, the, the typical model is uh, use a rabbit, you dissect uh, around one of the motor nerves, you implant an electrode cuff, and you fire that muscle uh, uh, bet for between six and twelve hours a day. And those of you who have been, had any experience with road riders who go to Majorca for their, you know, uh, base camp, you know they're doing between six and eight hours a day. So they are human models for animal research, as opposed to vice versa. And what happens when you do this is that all the fast twitch characteristics shift to slow twitch characteristics, and this happens in a matter of days uh, when you do this. And so here's here's an example. This this is a let's start over here. This is a trace of three muscle twitches. So I'm just going to shock the, the, the nerve. Boom, boom, boom. And what you see happening is that it generates force really rapidly, right? Like there's there's just no time involved. It's just going straight up and straight back down, generating force rapidly and it's relaxing rapidly. And it gets higher as you go. That's probably because the muscle gets. Uh, it's called post-potentiation activation. Post-activation potentiation, sorry. Pat. Uh, so you're generating fairly high twitch force, and you're doing it really, really rapidly. After a few days of chronic motor neuron stimulation, you get this. You get half the force. It takes a while to generate, and it takes forever to relax. So this is the unintended consequence of road training. Okay? That you are, if you do substantial volumes of endurance training, this is what, what your muscle is going to do. This is what it was, this is what it becomes. And so you want to avoid that. Even though you want to have fatigue resistance, you don't want to have this unintended consequence. It's a kind of training to get fatigue resistance because uh, this is, this is a study from 85, so this is classic literature now, but Marty, Gab uh, Marty Gabal is the senior author on this, and his lab has a 30-year history of this type of study. Their, their answer to everything is high-intensity interval training, really high-intensity interval training. And so this is one of the early studies. Uh, they did Wingate tests. Anybody done a Wingate test? Did you throw up? Yeah, okay, good, well done. So, so they did Wingate tests. Uh, with four minute recovery. They started with four and they advanced to seven. They did a Monday, Wednesday, Friday on two consecutive weeks. And what happened? Well, they, this is a time to failure endurance task. They gave them a power that they could do about, um, I think this is about 18 minutes before they started their training. Afterwards, they more than doubled that from doing 30 second all out sprints. <coughs> By doing 30 second all out sprints, they got better endurance. Why? Because they improved the oxidative potential in the muscle citrate synthase. This is a marker for uh, mitochondrial density. So how much can the muscle breathe and, and make uh, aerobic energy? So those Wingate tests dramatically improved their muscle's aerobic potential. So the, uh, the point here is that you don't have to go out on the road to become fatigue resistant. You're going to get fatigue resistant by
by doing sprint type efforts. And, and one thing we do, and we, we've been trying out, is we spend most of our year doing short stuff. We don't start by doing the speed endurance as a way to get fit. We do short stuff, which we're, we're chasing strength, we're chasing power, we're chasing our ability to pedal quickly, and we do that most of the year. We introduce the fatigue resistance stuff reasonably close to the competition. By reasonably close, I mean eight weeks out. Then we'll do, depending on the, the competition and how important it is, four to six weeks of that, and then two to three weeks before the competition, we start taking that back down again because it's pretty fatiguing and you want to be fresh for the competition. But we do the speed endurance very close to the competition because your body adapts to it so quickly. The other stuff is harder to get. To get more powerful takes longer and is harder work. Your body adapts very quickly. What we found, and, and I'll try and find some studies that Jim can share for us, that show that you adapt very quickly to those kind of longer speed efforts. Some people work very well with this kind of interval protocol. Some people it's too damaging for. But everyone we found so far works well with some kind of speed endurance pretty close to the competition. Because you also lose it fairly quickly. So if you start with your speed endurance and say, right, we're going to use that. We're going to do that first. We're going to get fit, do our speed long work first. By the time you get to the competition, you've lost that adaptation and it's actually affecting your endurance. Can, can I add something? I'd like to change people's mindsets around that a little bit because I think we concentrate too much on the recovery for the next sprint round and not enough about being the fastest. So the faster you are, the easier it's going to be because the earlier rounds are going to be easier for you because you're, race, you're racing against slower people. When you get to the point that you're the fastest but you can't recover enough and you're failing at the end of the competition, then worry about the recovery. But worry more about being as fast as you can possibly be and qualifying as high up in the competition as you can, because that's going to get you better results than spending too much time worrying on how well you recover from the sprint efforts. I agree with that. I was curious. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And no, I think it's, it's just question. a bit of a mindset change of, you know, we need to be faster. If you're the fastest person, everything's easier for you because you're always racing people slower than you and you can take the earlier rounds easier. When you get to the point that you're at the really sharp end and everybody's as fast as you, then you can worry a little bit more about the recovery. So the aspect of, of capillary density, I'm assuming that that's trained from endurance training. It can be, yes. But, 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 but uh, it's probably, like once you have it, it's probably easier to retain. You don't need to highly like access it all the time. Yeah, that's right. right. In, so, in, uh, in long-term detraining studies, uh, mitochondrial density detrains really quickly. Those are ex metabolically expensive structures, and your, if your body doesn't need them, it'll, it'll clean them up. But but capillaries are long term. So so my point is. Uh, so so that leads us again to activation and, and deactivation, and um, uh, so so this is uh, this is some comparative physiology. Uh, these are humans down here. Uh, this is a, a cicada's flight uh, uh, a vocal muscle. This is hummingbird flight muscle, and this is a rattlesnake tail shaker muscle. So, rattlesnake tail shaker muscles operate at 140 hertz. That's not 140 RPM. That's so 60 times that, 1,000 RPM roughly. Uh, how can they do that? They have unbelievably fast activation and deactivation. Why do they have that? Because 25% of the muscle cell is occupied by the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which is what releases the calcium to cause the activation, and then sucks the calcium back out to cause the relaxation. Look at this linear relationship. This is what, pe what these muscles normally do, and this is what is their percentage of uh, SR volume. So, how might you get more SR volume? Well, let's go to the art of coaching rather than the science of exercise, and let's look at this guy. So, Japanese Kirin school is great because there's no discussion, there's no motivating, there's you will do this right now. Right? So this guy does some high RPM intervals. Like this. Video quality is not quite what I hope, but you get the idea. <laughs> So somewhere in Kirin culture, they decided that really long, really high pedaling rate roller training was good. What do you need to be a good Kirin rider? 
You gotta have great power, and you gotta have great fatigue resistance. So what I think these guys are doing, I don't know this because I don't have biopsies on them, but I think, I think they're trying to move themselves out here <laughs> by doing chronic activity at really high pedaling rate. And just so happens, anecdotally, I can tell you that, that um, most of the guys in these two figures have done some of this. Yeah, okay, 316. Yeah. Um, so so the, the, uh, they call this clown bike, and the reason they call it clown bike is because it's got 100 mil cranks on it. Uh, and if they called it cycling, the, the cyclists wouldn't take it seriously, so they call it special neuromuscular training, uh, right? And, and um, that was Jason Niblett, but uh, also the GB squad, because Scotty Gardner built a clown bike there in, uh, in Manchester. So, um, so a lot of the world's best cyclists have done a lot of training at over 300 RPM. So anecdotally, it, it may be effective. Does it make sense scientifically? Sorry? From your perspective, does it make sense more than anecdotally? Anecdotal, does it make sense scientifically? It makes sense that it would happen, but we don't have the data to show uh, that the adaptations are there. In fact, the, the yeah, that I'll, I would digress. Yeah, yeah. yeah. good guy. Of course, relaxation speed enhances your overall relaxation speed in long term. Absolutely, that's the that's the message. Is that by doing that, by by coming out here and operating at higher frequency for prolonged periods, maybe you increase your your SR volume, and you become more like a rattlesnake, right? more like a hummingbird. <coughs> and that's one thing. of the things we've lost a little bit with the move to bigger gears because it's more efficient when we're racing is to bear in mind what you're doing in training and you still need some really high cadence stuff as we're going to show here to to work on this relaxation part of the pedaling stroke because it's so vital okay so take home message number five for your pop quiz high cadence work may improve power and fatigue resistance which i think you got that point <coughs> and just antidotally the, the 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 less fatigued i am so when i'm in a taper i do a roller warm-up my roller warm-up is seven minutes progressive, uh, a rev out in a little gear, 79.81, and then three minutes easy. That's my roller warm-up before a training session. My peak cadence goes up dramatically, depending on how fatigued I am. So when I'm in a heavy block, I'm around 220. By the time I'm getting to racing, you know, this week I'll be hitting 235. So it's quite a big difference in, in how fast I can pedal, depending on how fatigued I am, and how much gym work I'm doing. Um, so aerodynamics link speed with power. And so I struggled a little bit with what I wanted to present here. We'll, we'll keep this fairly short. Um, I've just put up one aspect of a modeling equation. So what determines the power that you have to produce to overcome aerodynamic drag? It's a fairly simple equation. It's a half times rho, this is air density. Uh, so right now we're probably 1.18 kilograms per cubic meter. Uh, CDA is what aerodynamics geeks call drag area. It's the product of frontal area and coefficient of drag. Uh, and this is what you get when you go to the wind tunnel. You measure your drag area. Uh, and then, of course, V cubed. So not just V, but V cubed, meaning that, for instance, to increase... Velocity by 10% means you increase the power demand by 33%. So going a little faster costs you a lot more power uh, because of the cubic nature of, of the demand. Uh, there's more to it, and I won't bore you with the equations, but uh, I, a lot of my work has been done in mathematical modeling of cycling performance. And this is, uh, this is another paper that I did with Scotty and Martin and, and Dave Martin. And what you see here in the open circles is power. This happens to be Sean Eady. Oh, no, I'm sorry. This is, uh, this is Anna Mears uh, doing a, a standing start 500 meters. Uh, you see power in the open circles. So 
Uh, you only see her hitting about 1,500 here, but that's because there's already fatigue inherent before she gets to the right RPM. Um, and you see the, the speed going up. The, uh, the black dots are her actual speed recorded by the SRM. The gray line is the speed predicted by my model. And so I think the, the take-home message is here that if we know the power, uh, we can drive a model that will do pretty much what the cyclist does. Uh, but with, there were three subjects in this study, and this was the biggest difference that we saw in, in all of them. So I wanted to know if we had something wrong. And it turned out we, 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 we got, Scotty found films of this ride. And uh, what this reflects is that she swung up the track out of turn four. And so she slowed down. The model didn't. <laughs> so, so the model was faster than her for the last 50 meters or so. Uh, anyway, so the point here is that if we know the power, we can do a pretty good job of predicting the outcome, speed and time and so forth. And so with that in mind, uh, we can start to think about, well, well what, how can you get faster? Right? We just talked about what determines your power and how you train for that power. But now, now you come to race day, right? You're at the national championships. How are you going to make speed out of that power? Let's talk about how we optimize that power that we've got. Yeah, yeah. How do you punch? And, and the answer is you punch a smaller hole through the air. And, and so we've got uh, Matthew Glatzer, I think you'll recognize even with the, the graphics, uh, who is under the tutelage of Nick Flieger, who knows every bit of science that I know, uh, has my model at his, on his desktop computer. Uh, and so he beats on Matt Glatzer day in, day out about aerodynamics. Matt totally embraces it. And, you know, that's why he's going, whatever he's going, 9.5-ish, uh, you know, pretty, pretty good. Um, so, so what you see Matt doing, both standing and seated, is being unbelievably low and compact. Low with a low back and compact with his elbows in, meaning he's taking them out of the windstream. And... I think you had something you wanted to yeah, share. Yeah, so I've, I've got some figures from a guy called Ingmar Junkel, who is the head of a uh, for specialized site that designs their bikes, works with the riders and improving their positions and stuff. So let me just get these figures right. So to give you an idea of how each body part affects your drag, your legs are 50% of the drag. There's not much you can do about that. This is why you're seeing people wearing these long socks. This is why you're seeing people with skin suits that go down long because light for is more aerodynamic than skin. So we want to try and cover as much of the skin up. But there's not much position that you can do about legs, apart from making sure your riders aren't pedaling like this with their legs out. Your body is approximately 10% of the drag. So we think a lot about flat backs but the next thing we're going to talk about is actually a little bit more important than flat backs. And that is your arms are 25% of the drag. Because cylinders aren't very aerodynamic shapes. So if you can change your position from that to that, as you see Matt Glates is doing here, you get a big difference in drag. So this is what you want to be looking for as a rider and in your athletes as coaches. You want to be trying to get these forearms parallel to the floor like this because you're basically removing this. And if we think about why aero bars are better for athletes and why they go faster on aero bars, because that's what you're doing. In an aero bar, instead of your arm being straight like this on the drop bars, you've moved your arm up like this and taken it out of the wind. So this is why he concentrates, and again, out of the saddle, he's doing it here as well as standing to maximize what he's doing. And then the last bit is your head is approximately 15% of your drag, which is why we want to be using aero helmets, and why we want to try to teach athletes to tuck their head down and in a little bit, make it more in line with their back. Yeah, a few years ago, I was struggling with the praying mantis position. I heard a study where they found that the difference from moving your arm from here to here was as high as seven percent. Yeah. Yeah, and that and that you know that that makes sense. Uh, you know, the GB guys did a study on their sprinters, just the difference between a rider like this and riding like this, and they found an average of fifty watts at a thousand watts, so five percent power difference between this and this. So you watch the top nations now. I'm going to talk about this in a second. Bikes are changing, much longer top tubes, so they can get more stretched out with their arms, higher bars, 
and it's all about getting into this compact position where you're getting the arms out of the wind, getting the bars tucked in. This is why they've gone to narrower bars as well. You're trying to replicate the aero bar position for sprinters. Did I see some questions? Yes, no, we, we, we actually touched on it. I was just going to kind of make a joke. Like, so you don't slam the stem all the way to the ground and put your hands down and get anymore? <laughs> Those days no, are over, my friend. Uh, <laughs> but that, you'll that see was, it, you know, this week. Count that, how many that was kids. was gospel a couple years ago, yeah. and I would have gotten into arguments with people left and right about it. So you know, you'll see a lot of it this week, as Andy said. You know, you see a lot of riders riding like this and thinking that they need to have their bars low because they want to get a flat back and, and be less concerned about back angle and much more concerned about arm angle. Sure, if you can get a flat back, that's great, but if you lose a couple of degrees on your back angle to get your arms up, that's the bigger game. Okay. So, what we have, this is, uh, this is ancient data now. I was uh, uh, in the right place at the right time. Um, some of you will remember the term Project 96, leading up the sports science initiative leading into the uh, Atlanta Games. So, so that started because uh, uh, I was with Team EDS and we were going up to the GM wind tunnel. And then EDS started sponsoring the uh, uh, cycling program, the sprint program. Uh, so I have data from the uh, Flint, Michigan wind tunnel, GM, going way back. And we, we were looking at elbows and I, what I show, I just looked at this uh, when I was putting this talk together. I have data showing that going from this to this in uh, uh, men and women sprinters had amazingly different effects between 4% in a relatively big guy uh, to up to 22% in a relatively smaller woman. So for th doing this, dramatically increased her drag by 20 something percent uh, and only for a bigger guy but nonetheless it's 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 important uh, so and then as as um, Lee was pointing out you want to have that elbow in so it's basically drafting off your fist if you will and how do you do that well one one important aspect of that for bike fit is that you've got to have your bars far enough out so long enough top tube or long enough stem so that your elbow doesn't have to clear your thumb. Right? If it's out here, uh, then you can get everything in line and reduce that aerodynamic drag, which that becomes very, very difficult for taller riders because you run into UCI limitations on uh, positioning. Doing an example, I'm on a 61 centimeter frame with a 15 centimeter stem and bars that throw you as far forward as you can get, and I am that far behind the 10 centimeter limit. Uh, we, we also saw uh, knees in versus knees out, 7% increase in drag. And I know a lot of people, this happens when they get fatigued. So not only do they slow down because they get fatigued, but they slow down because they put out a parachute. Uh, and then head position, we saw uh, around 7%. This is in the old uh, Project 96 data. And so what I did was uh, uh, I showed you earlier the demand model. In other words, if we know the power, we know what the cyclist will do. Well, I also now have a supply model, uh, which I've just done a screenshot here. Uh, so if we know the rested characteristics and we know the fatigue characteristics, then we can know the uh, how the rider will produce power uh, over time. And uh, the blue here is speed, and the reason it goes up and down is because uh, this is wheel speed. And the wheels go faster than the center mass when you're in the turn because you're leaning over. Um, and that affects pedaling rate, which affects power. Anyway, it's, it's mathematically it's somewhat complex. But nonetheless, at the end of the day, I've got a tool that we can do with a few clicks. We can optimize things. And so what I did was I just, I just evaluated from a baseline uh, fairly reasonable drag area what would happen if you reduced drag by by 5, 10, 15, and 20 percent. And this actually surprised me. It came out exactly linear, which doesn't make any sense because th these are not simple mathematics and they're not linear, but the overall result is like 999 linear. It's, it's remarkable. Never, never mind my geekiness. But here's the, here's the take home. For every 5 percent that you reduce drag, if you're in the range of an 11 second 200 meters, you improve by a tenth of a second. So that is nothing to sneeze at. And Okay, oh, 5%, that's a lot. No, trust me, that is nothing in one time. 
uh, most people are so bad when they come into a wind tunnel that 5% is chunk change and 20% is totally reasonable. So I think getting getting four tenths out of uh, half the riders that ride at T-Town is, is easy. So, so after him losing by half a wheel, Dave Martin set up a wind tunnel trip. Uh, these guys are in aerospace engineering. Actually, Nathan Berry is now at Cannondale, of all places. Uh, but all these guys are uh, uh, university, except Paolo Manaspa. He's, uh, his, his, he works for uh, work at Green Edge. His whole job is to study sprint finishes. Matthew Goss. Thank you, Matt Goss. So, so they organized this trip to uh, take Matt Goss to the wind tunnel, and they said, look, here are four positions that we see Cavendish adopting. Get in those positions in the wind tunnel, and we're going to see what difference it would make. And so head up and high shoulders is what Matt Goss was doing, and what Cavendish does not very often, but sometimes. So when he did that, this was his drag area, 0.295, the units are meters squared. When he just, from that same position, put his head down, his drag dropped uh, by uh, almost 20%. When, I'm sorry, almost 10%. Uh, when he lowered his shoulders, look at this, really big drop. And when he lowered his shoulders and put his head down, really, really big drop. So you're talking about from here to here. This is, this, this is not trivial. And then we modeled, because we actually had the power file for, the, for that sprint, we modeled, if you start with this position as your baseline, how much faster would he have gone in those other positions? Well, if he had just left his shoulders high but put his head down, he would have finished 1.8 meters ahead of where he did finish which would have been over a meter in front of Cavendish, world champion. If he had put his shoulders low, he would have taken a wheel, I mean, a whole bike length out of Cavendish. And if he had done this, he would have won going away. Interestingly, he wouldn't do any of those things because he said it was dangerous. Uh, pretty interesting. Uh, interestingly, uh, uh, a young Caleb McEwen was in the wind tunnel with them. And, and Dave Martin, who is basically a Jedi master, said, you know, wouldn't it be interesting just to see how low you could get your drag? Now, now you couldn't sprint in these positions, mind you. It'd be impossible. You'd, it'd be dangerous. You'd fall off the bike. You couldn't do it. But let's just see how low you could get your drag. And I don't know if you've seen Caleb McEwen, but he sprints. Well, I can't even do it. He sprints with his nose down on his front tire, and he's winning. Uh, Grand Tour sprints now. So so by doing what you can't do uh, and, and working as aerodynamics, he's actually had some pretty good success. Matt Goss ended up quitting the sport. Um, anyway, so, now, is, so excuse me, is the takeaway from this is no matter what standard you are at this point, a wind tunnel will always be beneficial. <coughs> so there's, there's, yes, let's say yes. Yeah, yeah. He, yeah, yeah. This guy could have gone from second in the world to world champion. <coughs> With one quick wind tunnel trip, except he wouldn't do it. And yeah, if you're mid 11s, you can go from mid 11s to lower levels. Yeah. Uh, and you know, it, for the kids, as we're going to see tomorrow, that's the difference between you winning or coming fourth mm -hmm. or fifth. It's a big difference. And you don't necessarily have to go to the wind tunnel. You can just look at pictures and no, you can start to work that. on this. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, sure, when you're really trying to optimize, you're going to a wind tunnel helps. No, I'm going to build a wind tunnel. <laughs> <laughs> Smaller hole in the wind is always better. How the Russians used to do this before the days of wind tunnels was take a picture of the rider, cut round the picture of the rider, and then weigh the picture of the rider with very accurate scales. And the lighter it was, the smaller the frontal area. Okay, almost done. So uh, now I want to talk about something different, and this is particularly salient here at Junior Nationals. Why? Because are juniors short or tall? Well, they, the they come in all sizes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. but a lot they of them start are short. short. <laughs> and because they're not six foot or more, their cranks are too long. Absolutely, their cranks are too long if they're under 5'10 or 6 foot. So here's uh, 
Let's see, we got uh, uh, Forsterman, short and super stocky. That's not an aerodynamic position. I don't in think any way. Huh, huh? In any way. I mean, like, yeah. he's short. Yeah. Could be down arms. there. He can't bend his arms because his bike position is too short. <clears throat> yeah. He's in an unoptimized helmet, and the guy still does 9-9. Nine -nine. So, you know, the game has moved on, yeah. not because now, Robert's not as good, but because he's production done the aerodynamics. It's, it's awesome. Yeah. Now you have Matt Leitzer over here. Okay, he's a little faster. Uh, this is Christina Vogel. This is kind of, well, both of them are kind of what you look like, right? This this, this cup shape moving through the air. So, and by the way, that-, that Used that, to look like. Used to, <laughs> did, did, past tense. The, uh, that specialized data, I think there's some assumptions there that you're already in the, in the right range. These people are not in the right range. Their, their torso is not 8%. I don't know what it is exactly, but it's more than 8%. And they, so they have huge gains to be made compared to a torso position like this, like Sir Chris. Why? Because Sir Chris and Matt Glazer are six whatever they are. They're tall. Their cranks are relatively short. Their cranks are hugely long. So they cannot get their torso low because they got to make room for their gigantic thighs. So, how are you going to get around that? Make them taller by putting shorter cranks on their bike. So, what limits how low they can get is where the top of their thigh comes during the pedal stroke. If, you, if you're shorter and stockier, you're compromised. I would say every sprinter in the world under five, Nine, five, ten is not optimal aerodynamically if they're on one six five or more. They could be uh, if they would use shorter cranks. <gasps> oh, shorter cranks, that'll hurt my power. Really? How do you know that? So it won't, actually. Uh, this is this is uh, data from my dissertation, which I collected a lot of the data here, actually, in T-Town. Uh, but uh, what we showed was that we, we didn't, my, my lab is all about signal and noise ratio. We don't care about the difference between 165s and 1675s. That's, that's for lenders. What we like, if we want to study crank length, we go 120, 145, 170, 195, and 220. And that's a, that, now that's a difference. And how much does that affect power? Yeah. Uh, not very much. Uh, it does, it seems to fall off when you get to the 120s, and when you get out to 220, this is when your thigh is up in your chest no matter who you are. Uh, I actually, I collected pilot data with 245s, um, and I, I gave myself whiplash, and so I didn't do that in the study. <laughs> my neck was stiff for a week. Um, but uh, if you look in this range of 145 to 195, uh, there's only about a 1.6% difference those are not significant, the, the, those are random differences. And notice that the one that is producing the highest power is the 145, not the 170. Yeah. And actually what I want to do, and I need to find a student to do this, I actually think this is not true. I think this is because of the way we set the seat height, and, and I think for, for, for very muscle physiology geeky reasons, I think if we had set the seat height different once we got under 170, we might, we might have maintained this, but never mind. Yes, sir. Okay, along the same vein, referring back to the aerodynamics, you know, whenever I work with my athletes and I try and tell them, you know, you've got to bring your shoulder down, bend your elbows, and your head down, and get more out of position, their response is, well, we'll not be able to generate as much power in that position. Do you find the same truth to that at yeah, all? Yeah, no, that, that's not true. Um, so, so there's a lot of myth around power production and Oh, you got to have the seat back to recruit the glutes, and you got to do this, and you got to do that. These are spinal cord level programs that fire because we evolved from critters who use certain actions. You don't. Why is it that your six-year-old can pedal at 130 RPM the first time she actually gets her balance on the bike? Nobody's teaching her to pedal. Right? Yeah, this, 
Yeah, 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 that too. I can give a little bit of an example from Ingmar, the guy that specialised in he, he practices this stuff on himself and also works with quite a few pro tour riders. When he first optimised his aero position, he saw about a 10, 12% drop in power. But after actually riding it and practising in it, the power went back up to the before levels. So if I say, if I said to somebody, hey, you can change your position, you're gonna get free speed, he gets annoyed with me because he says, it's not free speed, you've actually got to spend some time in a position earning it. So what he gets people to do is to practice the position on rollers and to put a little bar out that reminds them to keep their head in this tucked position and if they put their head up, they touch the stick that is sticking out, so to remind them to do it. And you know, he says you've got to do 20 minutes, 40 minutes a week on the rollers, practicing the position for two, three months, and then your power will get back up to pretty much what it was before. But even as we showed earlier, if you lost 10% of power, but gained 30% or whatever in aerodynamics, you're going to be going way quicker. It really doesn't matter. Aerodynamics is almost always more important than power. Now, what I, what I think you can do is, you know, you can run into interference issue, right? If your thigh is slapping your, your torso, that's going to take power away. For sure. So yes, you could compromise it that way. That's a that, that's a bike fit issue. And then uh, again, if if you can open your mind up to the fact that now crank length becomes an integral part of the fitting process, then you can get the torso low. And, I'll, and in fact, I'll show you in just a second. Oh, uh, so so it doesn't affect overall power. Uh, it also this is uh, uh, notice again. Paul Barrett, now the high performance director at, at GB Cycling, he. Uh, one of his, two of his dissertation studies were done in my lab. Um, he did the biomechanics of different crank lengths, and uh, not only do you, does the overall power doesn't change, the way the joints produce the power doesn't change either. When, in this range is 150 to 190, um, because that's all the SRM cranks will do. And in fact, have you done any like dyno type tests? Sorry? Have you done any dyno type tests to check? We measure uh, power at the, either at the uh, SRM crank or at the pedal. Uh, we haven't, we don't usually do moving bicycles, so no. But I, I don't know that there's a difference. That, that's the question I would get from the athletes, you know. Yeah, the, pedal, the, the power to the pedal can be the same no matter what the crank length. But the leverage to the wheel is yeah, because you know, your torque that you're generating is driving change driving the I, I, okay I see what you're getting at yes so so think about yes I, I get it think about the length of the crank as a lever which it is and as a lever it becomes part of the overall gearing system the main the most obvious part of the gearing system is the gears right the chain ring and the cog and then the size of the tire that's all part of the gearing system. The crank length is also part of the gearing system. And yes, you need to take that into account. And so that's why you saw the, the power cadence relationship shifts a little bit. And so yes, when you change crank length, you want to take that, in, that gearing into account. Here's the cool part. This is where it gets really interesting. You might say, ah, I'm going to reduce my crank length from... 170 to 153, that's 10% reduction. So I need a 10% different gear to compensate for that, right? It's not exactly right. And the reason it's not right is because when you go to a shorter crank, you raise your saddle so that you maintain leg extension at the bottom. So every point in the cycle except the very bottom your leg is now more extended. Mm -hmm. So now think about which are you stronger doing? A partial squat or a deep squat? Partial squat by miles. So your leg is more extended. It's actually stronger and counterintuitively it's actually slower. But that's okay. So so the, the that that you have to take that into account. And so if you go from 170 to 1 53, again, 10%, you don't have to compensate by 10%, compensate by about half of that. Because half of it is the crank itself, or, or, or the 10% is the crank, but the fact that you change the leg system, it, it cuts that by about half. 
Does that help your question? Well, when you look at the trend, though, of like oh, no, sure. and, and, and the bigger things are going, when you look at the bikes that are, the national teams are riding and stuff, like, I'm not talking about 155 millimeter cranks, we're talking about longer cranks because they're turning over larger and larger gears, which, so you have to get the same force and output with a longer lever, you're generating more torque. And because your RPM and everything is coming down, so when someone goes from 104 inch gear to 124 inch gear, they don't, if that's whatever percentage, you know, say 20%, 100 to 120, 20% 20 bigger gear does not equal 20% faster on the track. You know, you get a, a marginal bump out of that. But the longer the crank arm, the force is the same. The effectively, the easier uh, it comes Yes, to yes, but the stop there. Stop gear. there. Because the force is not the same. Well, the, because, stop, stop, yeah, because yeah, when you go to a longer crank, for whatever pedaling rate, muscle is shortening faster. And as you saw very early in the talk, mm -hmm. the faster muscle shortens, the less force it produces. Mm -hmm. It's a complex system. Mm -hmm. So, yes, you'd love to say, ah, well, it's a longer lever and I'm going to produce the same force, so I'm going to get more torque. Yeah, if you could, but you won't. Uh, you could statically. But once it starts rolling, then, then it gets complex. So foot speed goes, as you go for a longer crank, your foot speed goes up. So although you've got the longer crank, so the amount of time you've got per pedal stroke to put the force through the pedals becomes yeah. less. Yeah. To maintain the same RPM. But if you up the gear and you drive a slower RPM to output the same wheel speed, then you're actually okay with losing the foot speed. I, I, so I get, the, I get so where the, you're going, but the answer to this is in the data here yeah. that by changing the crank length, these things all factor out, and between the crank length of 145 and 170, it's all a wash. So choose that crank length based on the bike fit, not on the gear. Take, take home message number six is that crank length does not compromise performance, and so you can use it for aerodynamic positioning. And again, so this is Paul and. Uh, some of you may be aware that Sir Bradley Wiggins has the world hour record and that uh, uh, Paul was the staff biomechanist when they were setting him up for this and he couldn't get this low with his standard road cranks and Paul since he happens to be the lead author on that study said oh by the way why don't we just go to a shorter crank uh, and, and get your torso down uh, he was able to convince Wiggins to do that, and so this was set on. He's never told me what length this was, but it was not his normal road length. Uh, this is this happens to be an absolute uh, nobody. It's not Sir Bradley Wiggins, but um, yeah, this is me. It's you. I, I had to. Uh, I, I, at one point, I was setting up uh, a UCI legal position with uh, five centimeters behind the bottom bracket and various other constraints, and I'm. Uh, uh, 5'8 and 160 pounds, and I could not get, I couldn't pedal with a level torso uh, until I got down to 152s, these are 152s, and I didn't really like that, that's still too too tight here, so ultimately for me this fit was 145 millimeters. And I'm not that, I'm not, I'm not 180 pounds anymore like I was when I was sprinting. What about that head? What's that? What about that head? <laughs> That's a pretty crummy helmet. Anyway, <laughs> I'm trying to take my own picture, you know. Give me a break. <laughs> uh, anyway, so there's... So, future topics, things that, that I haven't been able to squinch into this talk, but maybe we'll talk about in future sessions. Um, as I said, uh, we, we know that if we know the power, we know the performance. So the question then is, can you predict the power to model the performance? And so this is, I got together with Nick Flieger. This is, this is uh, Anna Mears' data set. She, he pulled up data from her own testing at this time. We used those parameters to drive the model. And so this solid line represents the model's prediction of what she might do uh, during a 500 meters. And I, I'll let the data speak for itself. Mm -hmm. so, so we're pretty confident now. In fact, uh, this model, I had everything except her fatigue rate. I used an average fatigue rate, which maybe she's better than average fatigue resistant. Uh, the model was uh, within a tenth of a second of her 500-meter uh, world record. So, so we're pretty confident that we can model this. 
And the reason that's important is not because I'm a geeky guy who likes math. It's because you can't send your athlete out 75 times to test different scenarios. Oh, what about a 53-12? Whatever. Whatever gear. You can't send them out 75 times and expect them to replicate the performance so that you can make meaningful decisions. You cannot do that. The athlete's not going to do it, and even if she tried or he tried, it wouldn't give you the same power every time, and there would be environmental variations and everything else. So the only way to do that is to model. All roads lead to model. Uh, as I mentioned in various ways, we, we in my lab we've done novel training interventions. Passive warm-up is as good as active warm-up. So hot pants, hot tubs. Um, the US ski team for quite a while was using, uh, swear to God, you can Google this, sauna pants. They're marketed on late night TV, $39.95, you can buy them on eBay. They're marketed to melt fat away from your thighs. <laughs> I don't care what they're marketed to do. What they do do is warm up your muscles. And the US ski team was using them to great effect. Uh, and then when, when Ernie Reimer left the ski team, none of the other coaches were willing to take the generator up the slope to, uh, to, to do it. And anyway, um, eccentric cycling. I can cause more da muscle damage in five minutes than you've had in your life, uh, and therefore more ma muscle adaptation. Uh, right now, uh, my buddy Angus Ross in New Zealand is working with the world uh, shot put champion Tom Walsh. Uh, in, in 12 weeks of eccentric cycling, this is a mature world-class shot put athlete. Can you give us an example of eccentric cycling? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so a, a, uh, take a, a recumbent, recumbent exercise bike, right, like this. Now drive the, mo drive the pedals backward with a motor and resist them. So endless negative, right? Um, we had a master just doing that on the same issue. What's that? We had a master back in the day. Some of the older guys now you might remember. I forget his name. In San Diego. That if you put a hook up a trainer with a motor, and that's how it. Oh, good. Matters. Yeah, that's exactly how we built ours. Yeah, yeah. It'll make you more sore than than you can possibly imagine. Uh, or if you titrate it, if you ease into it, it'll make you stronger. And so, so Tom Walsh has been doing this. He did a 12-week uh, rotation, and this is a guy who was already deadlifting. I don't know, uh, Probably 300 kilos or close to. Yeah, close, close to 300 kilos. He added 43 kgs in 12 weeks to his deadlift by doing eccentric cycling. He's world indoor and outdoor champion in shot put right now. Um, is eccentric lifting? No, this is all eccentric cycling. I know, but eccentric lifting. It is, but it's hard to do fast enough. So there's actually a, a, a velocity component that's very hard to replicate without doing cycling. The GB team have a, a hydraulic leg press that they can do eccentric single leg press with. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Vicki Pendleton has an eccentric cyclergometer in her garage. Trust me. Um, anyway, uh, so uh, the frequency probably matters too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, what else? Novel training programs. Blood, BFR, blood flow restricted training. Anybody heard of this? Katsu training? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's That's like weird. magic. I've done it. How were your results? Uh, pretty significant. Yeah. Um, even doing Wow, in that short a time. That's great. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then, as I mentioned, single leg cycling, not a pedaling drill. Do not confuse this with, oh, pedal circles or scrape the mud or kick over the top. Or Just whatever. stamp as hard as you can. Uh, stomp on it as hard as you can, uh, but maintain normal double leg biomechanics. And that upregulates muscle respiratory capacity through the roof. Um, and we've, we've just shown that it actually improves on ice speed skating results in the U.S. speed skating team. So, uh, pretty, pretty exciting stuff. Yes, sir. Have you done anything with uh, malprescription? So you're only using your nose for the pattern things that it does for one 
haven't seen that. Just, cool. just before everybody goes, hang on one second. There's just one thing I wanted to kind of add to this. We didn't cover it enough earlier. When you're training this relaxation phase of the pedaling stroke, it's important that the majority of the time you're training over the optimal race cadence. So, although yes, you know, looking at gearing for races, you're looking 125, 130-ish for athletes. For team sprint, it's more like 145, 150 for the elite guys. So you're saying RPM. Yes, RPMs. Most of your training needs to be over that to take advantage of improving this relaxation phase on the pedaling cycle, and then you move to those bigger gears very close to competition. Don't think you have to do a lot of time in these bigger gears to get strong. You don't. You've got to do most of it over race cadence and then move to those to take advantage of it. If you do a lot of it lower than race cadence, you end up getting slower or not getting as much of an adaptation as you could do because you teach yourself to relax more slowly. That's why you do the Kieran. Sorry. Thanks, guys. Well, what a great session. Thank you for your participation.